My name is Pastor Wayne Wilson. I'm a missionary ministering in the Democratic Republic of Congo with my wife, Arlene. The COVID-19 virus has disrupted our world. Concerns over the virus have led many governments of the world to shut down vast aspects of their countries. This is so severe that in the United States, 3.3 million people applied for unemployment assistance a week and a half ago. This was the largest one-week filing for unemployment claims since records of such things were being kept. The basis for determining which businesses stay open and which are closed is often based on the government's determining if the business or organization is essential or non-essential. Some churches have been closed because they're viewed as being non-essential. For example, on Wednesday, March the 25th, LifeSite News reported the following. Abortion centers are open for business, but churches are locked down in Ontario, Canada and Quebec, Canada, as the two provinces ordered the shutdown this week of non-essential services because of the Wuhan flu pandemic. Ralph Northam is the governor of the state of Virginia in the United States. It is the locality where my wife and I live when we're in the states. Governor Northam has argued that abortion is an essential service, as well as state-owned establishments that sell alcoholic beverages. But groups of more than 10 people can go to jail for up to one year and be fined $2,500. When Governor Northam's press secretary was asked if the regulation included churches and places of worship, she replied, it includes gatherings at private schools, private clubs, parties, as well as any social get-togethers and religious services. Other municipalities and nations are closing churches without mentioning the specific reasons for closing them. An example is, the, an exception is the country of Tanzania. While Tanzania has been taking similar measures against coronavirus as other African nations, such as closing schools, quarantining foreign arrivals, and banning public events, the president has kept places of public worship open and has said that he will never close them. The president made his declaration based on likening the pandemic to Satan and needing divine intervention if the pandemic is to be quelled. This is the second and final message in a series I've titled God's Prescription for Dealing with the COVID-19 Virus. In the first message, I asserted that you and I ought to seek God so that he does not judge us or our nation. However, praying and repenting, as important as they are, do not end the believer's responsibility. There is a second aspect to our responsibilities. It is this second aspect that I want to look at. This sermon was inspired by a message delivered this past weekend by Neil Hoffman, the, a pastor at Foothills Christian Church in El Cajon, California, in the United States. The church was not always considered as non-essential. The church was considered to be essential after the time of Constantine in the 4th century. Testimony to its importance comes around 362 AD from the Roman Emperor Julian. Julian was a surprising source because he despised Christianity and wanted the people of the Roman Empire to leave Christianity and return to worshiping pagan gods. But as many, not as many people as he had hoped left Christianity because they felt paganism to be irrelevant or to use our current terminology as being non-essential. On the other hand, Christianity was considered to be both relevant and essential. In a letter that the emperor wrote to a high priest of a pagan group in Galatia in 362 A.D., he said the church demonstrated its relevance through their generosity to strangers, 
through providing material assistance to poor Christians, as well as to the poor in general, through the, their care given for the graves of the dead, and through living holy lives. The church's sacrificial actions were not based on them being inherently nice people. They were based on them being born again children of God. Their generosity towards others was a visible demonstration of the genuineness of their conversion. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 11, John the Baptist said that people should show that they were followers of God by giving a shirt to one who was poor if they had two shirts. And if they had food, they should share it with those who were hungry. Their generosity to others was to reflect the generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. The Apostle Paul wrote this about the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Believers understood that through their kindness, they were showing kindness to Jesus himself. In a scene of final judgment, Jesus uttered these words in Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me to your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. During this pandemic, medical personnel are telling us the best way we can help others is through social distancing. With social distancing, how can Christians help people in need? Foothills Christian Church is a USA megachurch with over 3,000 people attending services every weekend. As a megachurch, their media department is superb. During this season, they are inviting churches in the area that don't have media capacities to use their media personnel to record worship services for their congregations that can be aired online. Individuals from that church are also providing food and toys to families with children that are cooped up and don't have the resources to meet these needs. Individuals from that church are also checking on those that are most vulnerable, such as the elderly, and getting them medical attention as needed, as well as going to the market for them. In checking on their neighbors, several individuals came across a family that did not have electricity because they didn't have the monies necessary to pay the bills. The people put their resources together, they paid the bills, and the family's electricity was turned on. A major crisis took place in 1994 when the Rwandan genocide occurred. At that time, many refugees streamed across the border that were in desperate need of protection and provision. I've heard a God-honoring account of a family in Goma that allowed many refugees to stay in their compound and fed them for several weeks, even though it meant that they had to be confined to small quarters and they didn't have much money. I've cited these things not to say that this is how you must reflect your love for others, although some of these ideas may work well here. They're simply designed to provoke you to ask the question, how can I relevantly touch the people I come into contact with? I assure you that if you ask God how to touch the people around you significantly during this time and are willing to follow Him, He will provide you with direction. 
In this two-message series, I've indicated that God's prescription for dealing with the COVID-19 virus is twofold. First, we must get right with God. This is in keeping with the first great commandment where we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. However, we must not stop there because we are to sacrificially help people in need. This is in keeping with the second great commandment that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we be people that allow God's love in us to touch others. As the Apostle Paul expressed it in 1 John 3:18, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Dear God, I ask that you will help us during this critical time to show your love to others and that this might be the church's greatest hour. In Jesus' name, amen.